Good morning, everybody. I'm Steele Marcou, editor of Veranda Magazine, and I'm so excited to be joining you today with two amazing design luminaries from the landscape architecture field, Keith Williams and Mario Nevera. Thank you so much to, for joining us today for our second installment of The View from the Veranda, here with uh, the New York Design Center, the Design Center of Chelsea Harbor, the New York Cultural Society, and of course, Brandon Magazine. We're thrilled to have you here. We have a great topic for you this morning, something that we all could use a little bit more of um, these days as we're finding ourselves stuck at home and especially headed into the winter season. We need something sunny and cheerful to look forward to. Um, so I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists today first, and then I'm going to share my screen and um, we're gonna get our conversation started. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Mario Nevera. Hello, Mario. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Hi Steele. It's a Hi. pleasure. It's, so it's great good to see you. see you, even though it's over Zoom. I wish we were in person. Frankly, yes, I wish exactly. we were in person in Palm Beach. <laughs> About less, less than a year ago, almost a year ago. That's right, less than a year <laughs> ago, which is kind of crazy. Um, Mario was raised in the Midwest outside of Chicago and he was educated at Purdue before he moved, found his way to Southern Florida and opened up his own firm in Palm Beach um, over 20 years ago, which is quite amazing. And Mario, when I was um, preparing for this talk a little bit over the weekend, I was rereading the introduction to your book and um, I found myself sort of really smitten by the anecdote that you shared about um, your dreams when you were younger of living in a colonial center hall <laughs> house. And it just, it, it, um, it's, there was a thread that I found from, again, those, those childhood memories to your work as an adult um, in that I feel like your work is really grounded by a certain classicism. And yet at the same time, there is this overlay of you know, the individual personality of, of your clients and a respect for the original site, and um, even a sense of whimsy and escape, which we're going to be exploring today. But I, I loved that little note about your dreams of this sort of classic colonial center hall house. Um, uh, yes, it was it, <laughs> one of those things that I, I don't know what it was. I, I had a Lego set when I was a kid, and we, li we lived in a split level, and everybody around that. us was like a center hall colonial. I and I thought, that. well, why can't we live in a center hall colonial? <laughs> <laughs> and these so. days there's like a renewed appreciation maybe for the split level, which I think is kind of, kind of oh, fun. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, mid-century is way in and, and I was lucky to have one <laughs> in my childhood, but I regret, you know, I just, one of those things I hated when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Um, just to show everybody what I was uh, perusing this weekend, here's Mario's amazing book. I'm going to cover myself up, Forever Green. Um, <clears throat> and in it, there's another great anecdote that feels so appropriate for you, which is you're just this amazing listener. Like you can really get to know your clients and distill for them um, a vision for their garden and their space that they perhaps maybe wouldn't have been, of course, wouldn't have been able to come up with on their own. That I think in having gotten the great opportunity to get to know you over the past few years, I know I've picked that up as well. Um, yeah. so. I, I think listen, you learn your lesson when, when, uh, when, when, you know, Keith and I have learned the lesson and when you don't listen, you're usually in pretty big trouble. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. Um, well, jumping to Keith, your business partner, Keith Williams. Um, Keith, I was also, I also had the great opportunity to read your brand new book, The Graphic Thank Garden, you. Um, Thank you. over the weekend, which was such a treat. And um, I was able to discover that you also grew up in the Midwest yes. and you also um, were sort of, I feel like greatly influenced by a few key things from your childhood, including that you are quite an accomplished artist. And it's, I think it's amazing, you know, sort of knowing that about you now and being familiar with your work as a landscape architect um, to see that sort of artistic eye and that um, appreciation for you know pattern and scale and such um, materialize in the landscape and in the garden. So I'm excited to be able to explore that today. Yes, I, I love being creative, and um, you know when I've I've been with Mario now for 23 years, and the whole idea of me joining Mario and working with him is so I could paint more. Um, I haven't painted once since. <laughs> <I've> <laughs> How's that playing out for you? <laughs> yeah. 
it's played out great because it's a whole different creative release. So yes. um, it's, it's, it's something I had no idea um, I would like to do. And um, it's worked out beautifully, actually. I do feel like you approach the garden with a sort of painterly eye. I mean, it's amazing um, to see these things in three dimension and, and in, in spatial terms, but um, you really do have quite the artistic eye when it comes to the landscape. Thank, thank you. Okay, I am going to share my screen now and we will get started with our program. Let's see if I can. This is always the fun technical adventure of this kind of thing, <laughs> but it worked. Yay. You're doing okay. It's perfect. So far, so good. Okay. Um, let's see. So here we are. We've introduced ourselves. So our first topic is going to be um, something I'm calling gardens for now, because as we were preparing for this last week, the three of us were talking about how, my goodness, after um, the year that we've had with this incredible shift to home, that was frankly a rather sudden shift. Um, you know, suddenly we were all at home and, and, and home for the foreseeable future. That must have had a great impact on your business and what your clients um, were asking for from you as everybody was really sort of looking to the exterior and to their gardens and to their landscapes for a sense of sanctuary and, um, and relief, frankly. So I wanted to ask you if you guys could share a little bit about what you're seeing now, what, what clients are really wanting um, right now, essentially, from their landscapes. And this is, I love seeing these in process shots um, or the compare, the side by side of, you know, work being right. done, the transformation as it were, Keith. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I, I think if you were to ask us, you know, I don't know, less than a year ago, what, what trends were happening. And um, I think Mari and I both would say that people were, downsizing by, you know, purchasing more modest sized homes, modest sized gardens, easier to maintain and take care of. And, sure. and that has just totally a switch went off. And that's the opposite. Now people are back to buying, you know, more secluded properties, um, larger homes, larger land, all so they can incorporate all the amenities they would typically have at a club mm -hmm. um, or find in the city and just be able to use their home um, you know, have large swimming pools and, and particularly this picture is, a, you know, a comfortable fire pit with a seating area and umbrellas. And that's um, amazing. It, it's amazing. They have a tennis court, basketball court. They have it all. They don't need to go anywhere. <laughs> they just live in their gardens. So this, this almost looks like a resort to me. Exactly. Exactly. It's a little over the top, but, but that's, that seems to be the trend. Um, people are wanting, wanting it all in their gardens now, as opposed to downsizing and, and making things more manageable. And do you think, I mean, it's interesting to compare to a year ago and say that people, as you said, for, for really for management's sake, I mean, I think so much of that probably had to do with the fact that we were always on airplanes and they're really, if you're away, there's only so much you can do to maintain and really enjoy your private space. Well, that, that's exactly right. And people are, are doing this, you know, incorporating all the things they enjoy outside of the home, but they're also, um, moving, you know, they're not, they're not having multiple properties as much to kind of bringing everything together on one site. So that's a very good point. Incredible. Okay. Let's see. Let me, um, by the way, if I advance too quickly or you want me to go ahead and move to the next slide or move back, just let me know. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so what kinds of spaces and amenities and sort of design features are you all hearing about the most? Uh, well, uh, so some of these are Mario's images and some of these are mine. So I'll respond to the first image. And um, I think creating that indoor outdoor relationship is, is really a, a big request. Um, people just want to be able to open their houses up and um, live outside just as they would inside. Um, and is this, I mean, it looks to me as though this entire kitchen has completely opened up to yes. this courtyard. This is amazing. Exactly, and, and rather than just have a terrace and pavement out there, we, we incorporated um, a little softer feeling. It's actually fake grass, synthetic grass, which is a huge topic these days, um, whether to use it or, or whether or not. And I think in, in the right places, it works well. Obviously it's super sustainable, um, requires no maintenance, but it, it also allows you to set furniture out there easily without tippling, top, uh, toppling over and um, it just feels softer and it's greener. But, 
yeah, a total indoor outdoor experience. That's amazing. It is amazing how the green um, ground cover there makes it just so much cooler. You know, I can imagine um, being in the sun, but not feeling, I don't know, hot or it's just, it feels so much more refreshing that way. Yeah, it feels like you're sitting in the garden as opposed to you know, see a pavement. Exactly. Mario, what's happening in, um, in this other image here? So uh, we, we've had, I, I would say that Keith is right in the last, uh, you know, nine months, obviously, 10 months, uh, we have had a huge influx in requests for work. And I, I think, uh, and he's right, a lot of these properties and projects are uh, multi-generational, you know, wow. people who decide they're going to buy a house or buy a property and or, or invest in the property they own because they have nobody but their own family with them. Uh, extended families, uh, you know, pods of people that are hanging out. Um, so, you know, that's always, that's always like a, uh, it, it, to, to be able to go somewhere and do activities outside has been a huge uh, um, request. And so the picture on the right that you just saw is, is actually a, uh, a very fast, it would happen very quickly. It was a, it was a chapel, a, you know, a church and its church members called and said, hey, uh, can you get an outdoor ceremony and uh, worship space Amazing. <laughs> over the summer? And so, and fall in Florida, uh, north of here, <laughs> north, of, north, I know, it's crazy. And the, the beautiful site was they had these beautiful oak trees, huge, beautiful live oak trees, like the kinds you see in the South. And there happened to be four of them. And if you go to the next picture, uh, that you can wow. see, I know, it's pretty crazy, right? That and, is incredible. Yeah, and, and you know, again, we tried to use materials that were uh, easily easy to get, uh, pavers that are permeable, meaning that the, uh, the water goes through them. And um, to also look good when there aren't a lot of people there. Um, right. And it literally everything, you know, is done like an emergency. Oh my God. <laughs> and it, it ended, it, you know, it, it started, I think, it, in uh, July. We, just, we designed it before and then um, maybe in June or May. And then, uh, the, you know, they got the funds together really fast and they said, okay, start building. And, you know, we, it's part of our challenge is to do beautiful designs as beautiful as we can, but also to try to come up with materials and designs that can be installed quickly. So, uh, and the fountain is from a company in Pennsylvania called Campania. They make incredibly wonderful precast concrete um, material, you know, fountains. And so we were able to put it together really fast. So outdoor worship. So it's a funny request, but it happens. And, and I, we were very honored to do it, but it was very, it was high pressure. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, um, you know, obviously having looked at these images over the weekend, I, I love I, I'm, I'm actually, frankly, very inspired that this um, this church was able to assess its changing needs so quickly, right. and then pull together the funds, and of course, reach out to um, a genius like yourself to help them solve their new, you know, design problem. But um, you were going to say where in Florida this is, and I think I cut you off because I was so. Oh, it's okay. It's in uh, it's it's in Palm Beach County. It's about. Um, 20 minutes north of downtown, you know, of Worth Avenue, you know, so it's, an, it's actually in a small community just along the ocean there. And it's a tiny, tiny gated community. They happen to have their own church. So cool. yeah, really North Palm Beach, it's the village of North Palm Beach. So that's, that's really, I'm just always so focused on residential design that it's, um, it's really neat to hear about a community space like this that again, I'm just, uh, it's remarkable that they were able to kind of realize that their needs were evolving and and that frankly it's worth a more permanent investment perhaps in an outdoor yep. space I mean, Absolutely. I think that, do you all you probably yeah. see that um as well that that you know good news on the horizon about the vaccine and such but i think that um one of those amazing silver linings that we would like to perhaps carry with us is spending out spending time outside on an ongoing basis right. yeah I, I think we're Keith and I are definitely designing things that are everlasting. Uh, you know, we, we certainly don't want to do something because it was, you know, the pandemic forced us to do, forced people to do anything, but we wanted to last for a long time. So yes, a sense yeah, of that, uh, I don't think that, that feeling or that trend is going to go away. I think even though 
like you mentioned, the vaccine's on its way. I think people are still gonna think like, um, you know, wanting to be outdoors, um, wanting yeah. to have activities to themselves. I don't think that's gonna change too much. Yeah, I don't think, Keith's right, so. That's, that's amazing. Okay, what's happening here? So this is another, you know, uh, very fast, like incredibly fast job. We're, we're, we're a little late. <laughs> and, and in Florida anyway, is we get a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm sure you read in the news, certain areas, people are moving to certain areas yes. and, and deciding they're going to spend their, they're going to switch their permanent residence to Florida. And, yes. and it's been going on for quite some time, you know, pre-pandemic, sure. but um, it is, it has really inc increased, it's similar to how people in the suburbs or in the, in the cities are moving to suburbs yeah. so that the kids can go to school and be outside, you know, 11 months of the year. And it's, it's definitely the case here in Florida, here in Palm Beach, um, where people are buying up homes. And this particular property, uh, you know, we got a call, oh, you know, we, we're buying a house, we're gonna dip our toe into the water and I've got two kids and, and we might, you know, this is pre-pandemic, you know, might uh, move down there permanently, you know, or we'll be there in the winter, a few, few weeks in the year. And then the call came like, oh no, we're moving full time. <laughs> right and, now. <laughs> right now. And the two kids are two young boys, uh, you know, under 20 years old, very active family. And they said, wow. you know, we need a big yard. And, and by the way, we bought the property next door <laughs> so we can have a big yard. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Palm Beach, our, the properties are tiny compared to, you know, the country or, or the suburbs of New York, uh, of any city. Um, you know, a, a quarter of an acre is more like two acres in Florida and in, in anywhere else. <laughs> in both so, of your books, by the way, as just as a short aside, I love how you include plans and all of the plans are these like slender little... Yes. It's really helpful. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. It, it, you're right, you're right, Steele. Every, every site is very challenging. And this is one of those, it's basically two slender lots put together. One had the house and one was an empty lot. And literally, you know, we had to put together. And the funny story about this one was uh, this particular client, she, had, she, the realtor was taking her to other properties and she saw something that we had done, you know, a fountain, a pretty lawn, palm trees. And she said, literally, and, and when she calls, she says, I want exactly the same thing verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I figured, well, you know, it is, it's a rush. So uh, I don't, you know, uh, you know, imitation is the best form of flattery. Especially and, when it's uh, of yours, yeah. <laughs> exactly, you're, you're, I'm imitating myself, <laughs> we're imitating ourselves. <laughs> you get a lot of that. I love we it. We get a lot of that, That's so great. yeah. And so, so I took a video, uh, that Literally last week because it was it was just finished. Oh, this is so dreamy. And there, there's the fountain. There's the fountain. And the big lawn. <laughs> oh, that pool is so refreshing. It's so pretty. It's 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 a very pretty property and a very nice location and on the lake on the intercoastal. I'm gonna see if I can. I might not be able to play it. Yeah, just press it again. I think if you press it again, it'll. Press play. Hang on, let me try one more trick. There you go. Well, shoot, I'm having oh, well. trouble getting to play it again. But at any rate, how long did it take for this um, to come together? So it, it started, I think, in uh, officially started in like July. And you know, the, most people come here in the, in the fall and winter. So it had to be done by uh, Thanksgiving. That so is it, remarkable. Yeah, that's that that's the big deadline is for us is Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, that's always the big rush. And and I'm just as an aside, I'm kind of curious. Are you all um, with all of this increased demand? You know, a there's just increased demand. B people want it faster than ever. Are you um, having any trouble accessing labor or materials or um, even plant material? Yes, uh, it's really a. Uh, it, in Florida, funnily enough, because the material is, we use a lot of material that is based in Florida. Um, Makes sense. You know, uh, paving material, planting material, obviously, but uh, there's just so, there's a huge demand. So, uh, I, you know, it takes forever to make a piece of stone and then all of a sudden you've got hundreds of people wanting the same stone. Same. That's a big request. Yeah. 
the, the plant material is not so bad. It's, it's readily available. And as you can see from Mario's video, it's pretty instant too. I mean, the side goes down, the palm trees are mature. So that's, that's a benefit. Amazing. But we are, we are noticing delays in some materials um, and all of a sudden concrete is becoming a, an issue now. Interesting. Yeah. It's very so interesting. Well, the, the increase in demand and the influx, especially into places like Florida, is a topic I want to revisit um, a little bit later in our talk um, when we talk about sustainability. But for now, hold on, let's move on to gardens for gathering. Because again, this is very much, um, you know, it's, it's been, I think it's been a trend that we don't really like that word at Branda, but it's been a movement for a long time, but it has only accelerated in the year of 2020 that people are really choosing to gather outside so much more than inside. Um, and what better place for that, uh, obviously, than a beautifully designed garden and landscape. So I'm wondering, um, you know, how does your client demand reflect this as people are coming to you? Are they specifically asking for spaces where they can gather, maybe not just with their immediate family, but with medium to larger groups as well? And I know you've shared some projects here. Yes. Uh I, yes, absolutely. As I said, may mentioned earlier, you know, I, people are traveling in small groups, pods, yes. or they call pods, and um, you know, usually it's uh, the of uh, immediate family, like husband, wife, and children, and maybe the in their parents or in laws are are in there too, um, and then maybe it's like the best friend and their kids and the parents, right. you know. Um, so it. it, it Yes, you see that a lot, as you said, they all want activities outside, yeah. For so. sure. Um, can you all tell us about this project? I know yes. you see it on this slide and then there's a few more. Not yeah, this is definitely an example of uh, another, uh, you know, scale where, you know, uh, the client was pandemic uh, panic. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, so on the far left picture is, is actually me arranging chairs in 2019 um, and just kind of talking about the idea of adding some gardens. And, and this, you know, we were talking earlier about the Center Hall Colonial. Well, this was like my dream. Right. Exactly. <laughs> this is the ultimate dream, you know. This is the ultimate. This is the, well, this is the kind of like, when I grow up, I'm going to live in a house like that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then you roll up and you're in the car and you're like, oh my God, it's my dream house. <laughs> and, um, but what's funny about these older homes, and this is in Greenwich, Connecticut, is, you know, there's, there is definitely a, uh, a uh, everyone is paying a lot of attention to landscaping in, in these suburbs. And it, by no doubt, and these people had another home and they moved into this one and spent so much time restoring the house. And Keith and I get this all the time: is they forget about the landscaping, right? And so, and they've run out of money, basically, or their budget right. didn't allow. They've, for they've it. exhausted their exactly. That's right, exhausted the budget, exhausted the funds. And this was a woman and her young woman and her husband and four kids, four boys. Oh my! <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it was a very active family, and I was like, "Look, we can put a terrace outside of the living room and another one on the other end." And it was, it, the conversation got dropped in 2019. It just ended. Yeah. And then um, maybe around spring of the year, it showed up again. And <laughs> exactly. And so on the upper right-hand corner, you can see that the, where the chairs were in that picture, we're starting to excavate for a terrace. And on the lower right, I, I went there, I, I snuck away and, and got away uh, to go see this. And, you know, that's it right there. And of course, wow. the owner wanted lots of boxwood to go with her Southern colonial house. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes, she had the same dream I did. She did. <laughs> so, she did. <laughs> and evergreens, you know, and, and uh, it turned out too, we, we uh, in, the, in the first picture on the left, the grading along the lawn was sloping. It was this huge slope. And you know, she has four boys and she, you know, it was all about making sure they could play soccer and football. So we changed the whole lawn, like we, we raised it up, like tons oh, and wow. tons. Of, yeah, it was a very big project, very, very big project in a very small amount of time. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and here are we, is this, we're kind of tighter in on that. Yes, yeah, right. Foxwoods. That's right, it's the same property. Um, and, and of course, you know, um, it grew. <laughs> <laughs> no. I love it. The project, yeah. <laughs> it just expanded. Like, you know, we had one dining terrace 
and one living room terrace. And it, 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 it expanded to, will we need a second terrace off the family room and another terrace where we can have a fire pit? So it, it does answer the question about the gathering spaces and the outdoor spaces. And, um, you know, that sudden need and investment, you know, saying, you know what, regardless of the pandemic, we will definitely uh, continue to use it. Yes. And so we, we designed around that, you know, around that challenge. So. And you mentioned, this is something that I've, it's sort of like a hunch that I've had, but I haven't really had the right way to, you know, bear this out. But you mentioned, you know, a terrace off the living room, but also maybe a terrace off the family room. And I'm wondering if people are wanting just more, um, more ac access to the outdoors off of different parts of the house. Like I can go straight from this room out to here, or I can go straight from this room out to here. Um, because I think with more people being at home and inside, you're going to just need more and more access, especially on a property like this, where land, you know, where there seems to be quite a bit of land surrounding the house itself. It's not just sort of this one central living room or dining room. There's actually multiple spaces right. happening. Absolutely. Uh, like Keith had mentioned, you know, we have all these narrow lots that we're dealing with in Florida. And, uh, oops, sorry about that. That's it. Somebody's calling me through, and um, the uh, you know every room, you know we want to look out the backyard and see this expansive landscape, but then out of the other rooms off the side of the house, we try to encourage our clients to build up the views along the sides. And you, Keith had a, a couple of uh, images that that uh, show that where we we have to work in the 15 foot side yard right. to make sure that, that is a usable space for somebody, or or there's a purpose, you know uh, whether it's fruit trees or a vegetable garden, that kind of thing. Right. But it is, it, it is about creating all these outdoor rooms and these, these spaces, some of which I think visually you see and you, you, you get it right away and some you don't. Some are kind of hit and secluded. Oh, I like that. Yeah, creating a little bit of a destination, a surprise in the garden. I love that. A little bit more difficult in Florida on some of these tighter lots, but that's, that's the challenge. So, um, so the picture on the left is all about outdoor living. Oh. Uh, and it, it actually was, so the, the clients here are, are big boaters. They're probably in their, on their boat more than they are at the home, but wow. they, love, they just love being outside. They love being by the pool, lounging by the pool. So, I mean, everything you need, there's outdoor showers, there's an outdoor kitchen back there. Wow. Um, dining, obviously chaises. It's just very comfortable and, and I think not only does it create a, a visual effect from the house looking out, but um, it engages, the pool's engaged into the space. Yes. Um, there's a beautiful fountain at the end making sound. Um, just the natural palm trees kind of juxtapose in the garden. Those are just, amazing. And you can see, if you look closely enough, you can see we, we took the stakes off them so they wouldn't fall over. So, they, so when we took a photograph, you wouldn't see these ugly stakes holding them up. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah. So, and then, Keith, you're, okay. you're kind of, you're speaking to this, but I, I wonder, I mean, because it's one thing to say, I want all this out, all these outdoor rooms so that I can, you know, have neighbors over safe or just in general and have them to gather outside. But what are some of these design elements that you actually, that actually lure someone outside um, and kind of incentivize visually that, that um, gravitational pull to get outside and gather outside? Well, I think it's a combination of things. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think obviously landscaping can pull one's eye out. Um, paving, the way you set materials, paving patterns, um, contrasting materials, those can help draw people out. Of course, um, I don't really love seeing a pool. The first thing when I come in the house, but the water draws you out into this particular environment. Sure. Um, the trellis and the espalier work on the walls, oh, yeah. and even furniture, the color of the fabrics, um, just just them being comfortable looking uh, makes you kind of want to go out there and sit out. Just read a book. Yeah. Um, and then the picture to the to the right is basically um, you know dining al fresco oh. in, in the middle of a garden, um, amazing between the home, the pool, and a loggia, and the concept here is we just didn't want to have a table sitting out there and you're staring at a dining table. So we kind of <laughs> surround it with these trees, which, which makes it kind of a focal point and a little bit more interesting. For sure. Um, yeah, we, I mean, 
we have, you know, obviously I have to trim and sculpt these trees, but at night when they're lit up, it's absolutely amazing. It creates oh. this little green vestibules with these little windows that you can see through and filtered views to the pool. So um, it's really magical. That, it's cool. It's very fun. They and they use it all the time. What um what kind of trees are these, and what is the um hardscape here? So the the hard surface, there's a limestone pad that kind of floats in a bed of gravel. So okay. the trees actually are growing out of the gravel. Got um, it. There's flush lighting in the gravel. And the trees are, uh, they're called ficus nidida. Okay. And they're super green, super dense, easy to, to trim and um, keep looking uh, perfect all year round. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, it's a fun space. It's totally unexpected. It's very unexpected, and it I can I can see how it, especially at night when lit, would just be sort of a magnet. It would you would just have to get out there and experience it to yeah. really. Um, yeah, they've they've actually hung these um, uh, string lights like the oh, ones with the big round bulbs, which I didn't expect. And when I saw it, I was like, "This is the best thing ever." I mean, sort of like, like cafe lights. Absolutely, you feel like you're in the south of France. It's it's really really cool. That's amazing. Okay. Um, the next topic that I wanted to, um, this was actually the first topic that came to mind when, when I knew that you guys were going to be speaking with us today, um, was this notion of escape. Because I feel like both of you, um, a, a, an element that, it, that shows up in both of your work is this notion of sort of whimsy or fantasy. Um, and really the, the word that we all three kind of landed on um, to encapsulate the whole idea was escape. And again, I just think this is such a relevant concept for right now that your garden can be a place for escape. Um, both physically, you can escape into it if you need a reprieve or to get away when you can't really get anywhere else. Um, but then also visually, even um, sort of bringing in to, to, um, to, I, to thinking the idea of just even a visual escape of what you see from inside your house. So I kind of wanted to know um, from you all, one, if you could talk about some of the elements that you use to infuse the garden with a sense of whimsy or a sense of escape. Um, yes, I, I think Keith and I are, we're known for the level of uh, detail that uh, goes into our work. And when we think of uh, escape, we think of infusing the garden with the details that will help support the imagery and the feeling and transport our clients mm -hmm. to another place, you know. Yeah. They may say, I want to be in Morocco, or I want to be in Italy, or I want to be in Europe, or I want to be in Japan. You know, they, they want to be somewhere, or they may have seen a garden that is inspiring to them that, uh, that they want to. So, we, so we, we try to infuse those elements into the design and, and make it fill into the context, you know, mm -hmm. and um, which is wonderful because it, it's a lot like interior design or architecture when we can take elements um, and use them creatively that are not plant material. You know, a lot of people think of landscape architecture, which is true, we work with plants, but that's just part of what, we, you know, we, we try to incorporate all these different details and, and uh, materials. Truly, truly. And uh, as the case is this, is this one was that the uh, client, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was about to go away. She, they had spent all, most of the year in Florida in 2020, but they were gonna go away for a bunch of months and said, when we come back, can you change the garden from this sort of mundane and banal garden to something <laughs> more exciting for us? I love it. And um, they, they, too, they, have, they have grandchildren and children and it was, it's a big house that they all convene to when they're all in Florida together. As, as, and they're very artistic minded and big, big time collectors. And um, so I, I had to like, okay, you know, uh, how do we do that? And, you know, the, the owner uh, wife uh, is, is, uh, has a Latin background. She grew up in Latin America and she's of a Latin descent. And so she, she, she was very interested in, in incorporating tiles from Europe and, and Spain. And oh. uh, so of course she picks this tile on the left to, to uh, line her fountain. And, and I can show you the fountain later. And she only had 20 pieces, you know? I love it. <laughs> Gorgeous tile. Yes, it's incredible. It's antique tile from Solar. It's amazing tile, right? Mm -hmm. And 
I was like, okay, well, we're going to have to bring this out to the other side of the house where the pool is. And we had, we literally imitated it. We got a local tile guy who could just come up with the inspired pieces to mm -hmm. line this, you know, the 40 foot long swimming pool in the same tile. Um, Amazing. But you know, that's her desire, you know, to incorporate into things that she's remind reminds her of her youth and where she grew up in her culture into the garden. Yeah. She's sort of saying, can you, while I'm gone, can you take my garden and convert it into that, you know, vacation abroad that I wasn't, I'm not going to be able to take for a little while. Exactly. Oh my God. Yes, 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 absolutely. They can't travel, you know, woe is me. Uh, but they, they were, able, were able to create an environment that they are transported to. That's so, really amazing. Yeah. Uh, same property. Is this the same uh, thing? Okay. Yeah, same view. But, you know, like, like, it's an opportunity too where, um, as Keith had mentioned earlier, everyone's spending a lot of time outside in their loges or their outdoor terraces and things. And um, we have to think about every aspect of the experience, as, as Keith had mentioned, you know, incorporating fire pits and showers and things like that. And, you know, we, we had to put in, in this particular property, we had to put in more shade. The sun comes right into that loggia. Uh, most of the day and what you know we have to add and something that shady and, and the answer was an awning funnily <laughs> enough, a retractable one so it didn't take away from the building architecture but it, it helped reduce the shade by almost 100 percent. i mean that's not even all the way 100 percent open and you oh, can wow. see the ground where the where the valence pattern is in the shadow if i bring it out to its full amount that whole loge will be I covered up it. so it's it, we have every little detail counts for us and uh, we help in every aspect to make sure it works. That's, that's a really um, impactful design element because again, just creating that level of shade for somebody will make it so much more comfortable for such a longer period of the day and really probably as the sun moves around throughout the year. And that, I mean, that can just make such a big difference in how much somebody actually uses for space, which is- Yes, great. absolutely. And trying to respect the building architecture as well. Yes, to complement it the best we could. You know, we were talking about awning or not awnings, but trellises and pergolas. And I said, you know what? I think your vision of Europe and, and Spain and, and um, your tile, I think a simple awning would help sort of create that romance that she was looking for. Oh, it's, so, it's such a beautiful solution. Oh, wait, did I, I, I went too quickly. No, okay, so is this the next slide? Yes. Okay. Yes. These are two of my favorite pictures from you all. And um, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so excited to hear you tell me what's going on. Well, you mentioned whimsy. So I thought yeah. I'd show you something whimsical. <laughs> uh, I think, um, uh, like Mario said, whimsy can come in all different fashions. It can, it can be planting trees, paving, tiles. Um, but I, I tend to think more about a whimsical structure. Mm -hmm. um, us landscape designers and landscape architects always like to play architect. So this is an opportunity to do that. Um, and for the picture on the left, uh, a client of mine, uh, kind of a tight little space again in Palm Beach and, and wanted somewhere to go in the garden and be able to uh, have a cup of coffee and read his paper, which he does on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. And and so we designed something that was more of a folly, more whimsical. Um, it actually has this, it's, a, it's actually aluminum, it's not wood and it's oh, powder wow. coated. Yeah, and it's designed so it looks like wood and painted so it looks like wood. Uh, it act, and it has a, a canvas awning uh, that's kind of tucked in underneath. Oh so, yeah, you can see that. Right, and it's, it doesn't, I mean, it'll protect you a little bit from uh, a misty rain or a little bit of a rain, but a downfall you're probably gonna get wet, but right. it gives you some shade protection. Um, it also creates a feeling of a roof um, and, and a, like a ceiling above you, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's something fun to design. It's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you're just not afraid to dream a little bit and come up with something great. I love I will, that. I will say my, uh, the, the client, the husband wanted this and saw the design and loved it. And the wife saw the design and got really nervous um, and he said, just go for it. And so we went for it. And when it was done, she was, she fell in love with it. So it, it's one of those things, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be willing to take the risk here. 
and she, um, she got nervous because she felt like it was just that whimsical yes. or that sort of fantastical and she thought it may be too, too whimsical the house is more bermudan this has a little bit of um no, I wouldn't say Shin Warsery, but it has a little Asian influence. There's almost it. a pagoda thing yes. happening here. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I love that. I love yeah, that. So, and it is right at the end of the pool. So it's dead on access. It's a focal point. Um, Beautiful. But the good news is she loves it. <laughs> Actually, doing another project with her and, and we did something similar. She was like, can we have another structure like that? I'm like, sure. Oh. <laughs> Look how it, um, how it all right, just so the picture on the right is very similar. Um, this client um, of, of ours is a huge garden. Um, she loves gardening. And um, she wanted a structure she could tuck a few chairs and get out of the sun, um, but still have that open environment feeling. And she wanted a real slat house to, to grow her orchids and some of her plants in. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so that, that's what influenced this structure. And again, that's a metal roof with these metal slats it's open, there's no canvas in there. So wow. it gets filtered, filtered light. Um, she's, and the, the folly part is the, the faux columns on, on either side of the opening are basically these uh, planters with palm trees. Um, it's an image she saw and she showed me. So we came up with a design. So it, it looks like it's kind of holding the structure up. They're um, amazing. It's really fun. It's really fun. And are they, um, are the, is this metal as well? Like a yes. little? Okay. That's correct. Um, and actually, the they, people that made it were ready to kill me because every day we'd go out there, bend one of those, turn one of them, add one, <laughs> take one off. It was like a two-week process installing it. But at the end of the day, I think it came out really great. And she loves it. She uses it every day. That's it's amazing. Just tucked away and stuck in the garden and pulls off to the side. You, know, you really don't even know it's there until you go out. What is, there's a little, like there's a counter back here. How yeah, she, did she use it? So that's basically a, a little sink and a countertop and cabinet. Okay. And she didn't want a full kitchen. Um, on the other side, there's a changing like shower um, bathroom. Wow. And, and opposite that countertop, there's actually storage. So you could store cushions and things in the backside, which is always a, an issue when you're in Florida because it rains so much. Yeah, that's amazing. I love this. It's fun. So fun. Okay. Um, tell me about what's happening here. All right, so that's, this is kind of taking a lead from Mario's images in the tile and, and playing with whimsy in, in the gardens and actually in the basin of the fountain here. We, we, um, this project is in Palm Beach and um, it's a, a lot of influence from um, Jefferson and, and all the gates he would design. I love it. Um, and these people live in West Virginia and they've kind of moved all the way down here and they wanted to incorporate those designs and patterns in the, into the garden. So not only in the gates, but we decided to do it in the, in the fountain. And this is actually um, a mosaic pebble, um, wow. black mosaic pebble with a white mosaic pebble, just set like in a, in a concrete foundation and then grouted. And then um, it runs the, the entire fountain length up to the house. And the emitters kind of spinning in, into the fountain are actually in the planting, not in the coping. And oh yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. These big magnolia trees, you know, flank the fountain. And there's a time of year actually in my book, you'll see this same image, and that bougainvillea is just flourishing. It's amazing. Amazing, amazing. But there's there's the whimsy in that garden, I think. Yeah. Um, it's it's really it's great. It's it's fun to see another reference like um like a monticello style you know exactly. and, um, uh, design but then blown up on this scale and pebble mosaic you know just kind of makes you it makes you really yeah they were they were die hard on the monticello he actually sent me a book and i had to read the whole thing and study it so oh, my <laughs> it's fun that was a lot of fun and what's um, Keith, can you tell us about this image on the right? That, I'll let Mario describe that. Mario? Yeah. yeah. Um, it, you know, like, like we were saying earlier about uh, whimsy and escape, and the whole topic of escape, I think it's easy for uh, anybody to create a sense of, of, of escape and, and um, 
creating a, a special place. And we were talking about how side gardens are always used in Palm Beach anyway, uh, where we want to do something to really elevate the property. And all we did here was add a row of palms of a pathway. And I, th I, I want to say that, uh, we want to say that it's very easy to take a space and fool around with it. And maybe a space, a secret garden that you had mentioned earlier that nobody uses or you happen upon. And, and just by doing some geometry and some symmetry and, and some very controlled elements of color, you know, you could add that. And you could add that sort of whimsy, right? And it, it can happen very quickly and easily. It, Let's say I was in up north again in Connecticut, you could do a row of Alberta spruce or, or, or in the Hamptons, maybe just a row of Leyland Cypress. It's the idea of continuity, something that draws your eye uh, and creates a, a whimsical faith in a, what was being used or narrow, or normally a narrow side yard. Uh, it could have it could have almost been overlooked, and yet now there's this kind of colonnade and a sense of approach that just draws you out, which is amazing. Right. Correct, yes. And it's probably, it's probably only 15 feet, wow. <laughs> which, is in, which is incredible. You, you know, people don't realize they're, they're, there's so much you can do with 15 feet. Uh, people just ignore it. And some of these homes we go into are so overgrown and we start clearing it out and designing these, these walkways and terraces on the side of the property, they're, they're just blown away by the amount of use they can get out of something. They, they had no idea. That's amazing. Okay, apologies for those of us who can hear the echo. I wanna to move to our um, our <laughs> final and, and perhaps most important topic um, today, gardens for the future. Um, we, when we were talking last week in preparation for this, you know, I know that um, for both of you, um, the notion of preservation and conservation is so important. And I think obviously, you know, this applies to working in the Northeast as well, but particularly working in Florida, um, you know, you're working at very historic properties, but you're also working in, um, as you spoke to earlier, Mario, this, this place that, you know, people are moving to in droves. Um, so you're getting a lot more uh, use and sort of traffic on the natural landscape. And I just, I have a lot of questions about, you um, about how you all work in this. And I wanted to start out with the, the question about native plantings. So this has obviously been um, kind of a trending topic, if you will, in the world of landscape design. Um, but I think that it may even be, you know, finally sort of really catching on um, all the way on the consumer end of things. But I wanted to ask you, what role does native plantings take in your work? And, um, and how are you all kind of using and thinking about them today? Um, well, you know, native role, I, I, well, first of all, I think our clients, I would say, are so much more educated about sustainability. Um, and when you say sustainability, I think people think of native plants. I mean, there's much more to, to it than that. But um, I don't think they're educated on how to design with uh, native materials or how to design appropriately for sustainability. They just know they want less maintenance and less water and they don't want their irrigation bill to be that big. So, right. <laughs> um, so we obviously we have to guide them in that in that direction. But um, and I'm speaking to the picture on the right here. Uh, this was a property that um, was an overgrown jungle. Um, it's direct oceanfront. Um, it has a very high ridge um, behind this picture that kind of protects um, this environment. But the, you know, this is actually a wetland that my client didn't even realize he owned or had. When they started clearing this property out, they discovered uh, a lot of wet area in the property and um, get it, got some surveys done, got DP out there at the Department of um, Environmental Protection and discovered that he actually had a wetland on his property. So um, I think that sparked an interest um, and, and, and it, was, it wasn't done properly. People were dumping water in it. It was a mess. So we, oh. we kind of, yeah, it was, a, it was a big nightmare. So we kind of took everything out that was exotic and we replaced back all the natives. Um, and this is a big area. And he loved it so much. He wanted to, to be able to experience it. So we actually designed a boardwalk that would meander through the wetlands. Um, Wow. and take you in and out. And it's pretty incredible because it protects um, an ecosystem that, that once was there that kind of 
disappeared over time because people mismanaged it. And now it's come back and um, it has mangroves and, and grasses um, and just all kinds of native materials that bring back the birds, obviously the bees. In fact, he started his own beehive because of this. Wow. Yeah, it's five of them. It's pretty incredible. Um, butterflies and just a lot of um, you know wildlife that, that has returned to this property. Um, and it's incredible to see and it's incredible to watch it evolve over time. It's just, it's, it's something I haven't been able to do. It's kind of the first time I've been able to do something like this. And it was a lot of fun and very, I was educating myself. Let's put it that way. That, yeah, that's fascinating. Do you think that at the risk of um, revealing my lack of education on this topic, do you think, is there resistance? If there is any resistance to native plants, planting and designing a garden with native plants, is it that, um, there is the misconception that you can't design, that that's essentially letting it go wild. And yet there are some conscious choices you can still do to create an enjoyable space. Um, I, absolutely. I think people think of native plants as weedy um, right. and undesirable. And I think the, the exotics have been around, you know, these beautiful plants that have come into our environment been around so long. That's what they see and rely on. That's what, you know, that's what my friend has, that's what my neighbor has, I want that. Right, um, exactly. That's what I see next door, so that's kind of, yeah. Exactly, but I, I don't think that's the case. Actually, I think, um, and, and I just finished my own house and I'm, I think I'm 90% native um, and I love the colors, I love the textures. I do love the fact that I'm not spraying a bunch of chemicals um, right. to maintain them, but there are so many things out there that I wasn't even aware of that I just fell in love with and you know it's color and texture um, and I just think people don't quite understand that um, so obviously that's what we do we're supposed to show them that and right. <laughs> give them that. amazing and and Keith I'm sorry did you say these all three were from the same project or is this something else over here that's something Mario's um, okay. concocting over there okay <laughs> yeah Mario, on the right what's going on sure uh I think what to add to Keith's uh, image as well is, you know, natives, we can use native material and work around native environments and still have a designed and um, whimsical or fantastical experience. I mean, if, if you even notice that tree, the, the native tree, the native banyan, you know, we were, he created a pathway going through it. Through you know? it, I love it. I, and that was really, that's a stroke of genius, uh, Keith's genius. Oh, thank is, you, Mark. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, to be able to have the opportunity to create that window that looks out to the wetlands, yeah. that it, you, where you are, where our clients and and their children and their families and their friends are interacting with the landscape. Yeah, yeah. very different than um, just looking at it, you know. And um, and the, the picture on the right, for instance, you know, it, it's a, it was a it was a it's actually the back driveway of a property, and um, the client basically said there's too much paving back there. And so what we did was just create a raised planter made of native stone on the upper right. Okay. Um, it, it's about you know 18 or 19 inches high. And, and we planted a native tree, a gumbo limbo in the tree, which has this incredible exfoliating bark. Amazing. Um, that yeah. really will create a nice shadow on the driveway and, and still have room to park a couple of cars. And um, I think that you know, they, they, these people have everything. They have all different kinds of plants and different kinds of, of, of sculptures and elements. But Oops, the sorry. idea that we could give them something that was native, uh, that, that they can enjoy. And it also becomes sort of almost, almost like it is a focal point, but it's also something of a conversation piece for them. Oh, so, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and I love just, that you, you mentioned the shadow. I mean, that, like, that adds a whole other sort of level of art to the driveway. Absolutely, absolutely. That the tree, it because of its branching, light passes through it, and you can even see on the right, on the bottom right of that picture, um, the bottom right of the of the planter picture is that there's shade already created just by that sunlight in the morning. Um, you know that that will create that That's pattern amazing. all day long. Um, and and this is the same property on the bottom right picture. Is um, they also wanted to live off the land a little bit more. Love it. So we created an extensive vegetable garden um, 
which is of using um, varieties of plants that are now much better in Florida. I mean, it used to be where um, vegetables and plants weren't hybridized to tolerate um, the excessive heat mm -hmm. um, and moisture. Moisture is always a problem in a garden. We, we have to, um, you know, we have to drain it. And in most vegetable gardens, they have to be well drained. So a raised bed is clearly the rule in most uh, home vegetable gardens. So it's not, it's very much the same in Florida. They have to be well drained, but you, there are tons of different varieties of lettuce and arugula and, you know, carrots and radishes and tomatoes that all do much better in the Florida environment That's than so cool. think. So. Love that. So in this, this area, it looks like it's just, is it the same area that's just passed here? That's correct. Okay. That's, it, was, it was really, we took this whole side yard and made, it, made, the, made the driveway much more, every day that they use the garage driveway, made it much more of a courtyard feeling and then walk through a secret hole, secret path, and then you're in the vegetable garden, which has- That's, oh, that's really magical. And what's happening here? So Keith had mentioned, or we have been talking about plant material that is less, um, and when we talk about sustainability, we're also talking about our environment. And yeah. um, we had mentioned that in his own garden, he's reduced the amount of spraying of, it, of pesticides. And that is definitely something that we are trying to uh, very much promote and instill in our clients. It's funny because, we were very much, we are still very much into design and beauty, but when you actually see or experience what it's like when they come and spray for yeah. something, um, it's quite a shock. Mm. You know, I, I remember being with a client, these potential clients, and we were, we were looking at their property, which they were going to renovate, and the neighbor next door was spraying their hedges, you know, spraying the, putting an insecticide on their hedges, their green hedges. And I was so scared for my client. I said, you have to go. <laughs> yeah, it's, it goes everywhere. It's there. Yeah. And it it's just, like, yeah. Yeah, it, you just can feel the toxicity. Oh, and um, so in, in this particular, we looked at this earlier, but um, I, I said, we need to take out the back hedge and plant plants that don't require any kind of spraying. Yeah. And at the same time, create depth and beauty uh, right. and a sense of color is a very shady spot. So I picked uh, a, uh, a copper leaf, which is, uh, it, the botanical name is Alcaphala. And they, they come in multiple colors of reds and burgundies and oranges, which a lot of clients don't like, but it just so happens to have variegated green and white, pale yellow. Uh, so, so that was the plant that I chose that doesn't require any spraying. Um, it grows very well in the shade and provides a shock of color, a, a brightness into the garden. I love that. Uh, yeah, it's great. So try to get rid of the spraying. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, I know that you all both uh, work very much, very closely with the Preservation Foundation of Palm Beach. And this is something that they um, have elevated on my own attention because it's just so interesting how much damage that spraying and how, as you say, just how much it is or how much it requires. Um, it's shocking how much it requires. Yeah. I mean, we, I don't think we'll ever be able to eradicate uh, the ficus plants or all the plants that require spraying. Sure. Um, by virtue of the fact that in, in Palm Beach, especially in Southeast Florida, the hedge, the ubiquitous hedge is very much a cultural phenomenon right. in Florida. It's not just, you know, it's not just something that creates a barrier, but it, it is literally what identifies um, the area, you know? Right. And so we have to find solutions or substitutions or use other plants that can create the same level of drama. Um, but also just trying to tell our clients and ourselves that it's important to think about our health. And, it is, uh, yes, absolutely. And, the, and our health and the health of our um, landscapes. Um, another, and I'm, I'm moving us along because we're, oh, we're right at the end of the hour, but I wanted to ask oh. just a couple of final okay. questions. Um, what about the role of preservation in your work um, in terms of creating sustainable gardens? Because again, you all are, especially in Palm Beach, working on properties that, you know, are almost a hundred years old and you're carrying them forward into the 21st century. And I'm just curious um, kind of what you think about when you're working on those types of projects. 
Yes, I, I think, and, and I know Keith believes this as well, is, is uh, we, we want to extend and solidify the legacy of, of whether it be your own particular home or the home and located in a, in a historic district or a historical home um, to, to create something that's everlasting. Uh, mm. And that goes with plant material choices that we hope that will be there for 25 or 30 years. Um, decorative accessories and, and materials that, you know, we've been talking about previously. Um, and to, to really enhance our environment, no matter what community we're in, both visually and from a ecological standpoint. Mm -hmm. And um, I think especially now with the, where we are in this year with the pandemic and generations of families that we talked about are living together, we wanna create a sense of safety and, and where people can really live together very happily. And um, you know, we wanna use material like in this picture on the right, take out the bad paving material which is on the left and put in very easily is just put in a native natural paving so, material like coral to it. right and new plantings and, and to create the sense of enclosure of a courtyard. But that it goes along with the idea of it being create a sense of preservation where preservation wasn't necessary or didn't exist, you know. I think that's actually so important. It, it, the role of preservation and even conservation um, in a place that where it isn't maybe naturally there or naturally enforced, but this, this image here really speaks to almost placemaking as it were in a residential environment. I mean, this, this feels like South Florida where this maybe doesn't feel as authentically Florida. Yes, authenticity and place in place making of spaces is definitely the uh, that's a great description of what we try to do is is use our cultural uh, that surround the cultural society or cultural landscape that surrounds us and employ that in a, even on the most personal level. Yes, because there are those tiles. Yeah, <laughs> this this project very key in my life this summer. So. <laughs> I love it. Um, what's happening here? What other, what have we uh, left off when it comes to sustainability? Well, I, I think, I, 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 I think Mario covered it very well. Um, but I also think, you know, you mentioned historical sites and preservation. So I think there's um, something to be said about repurposing materials that, that are on site, whether yes. they stay with that or you move them into a new location. Um, so you're preserving the site, you're preserving the history of that site. Um, obviously, it's nice to not disturb a site um, if you don't need to. Sure. Uh, but in, in most of these cases, um, we find ourselves having to move things around um, for all kinds of reasons, whether it's you know underground utilities or new foundations, walls, etc. So, but I like to keep um, the feel and the vibe of, of a property as much as possible. Um, it's been there, it's acclimated. So that in itself is the sustainability right there. Absolutely. And, and I think too, um, I think people don't realize that um, you can design a garden. It's all about location of plant material. Um, most people already know that, but I think you can design a garden that you can just let grow, let flourish um, and not have to constantly maintain it by clipping it and pruning it and, and fertilizing it, which is, kind of what I'm showing you on the picture on the, on the right. Um, it's more of a natural environment, but this garden just is allowed to grow and do its thing. We do, I will say this in Florida, we do something that's extremely barbaric and that is in the summertime, we come and cut everything down. To <laughs> <laughs> we do, it's a jungle. <laughs> it's a, you, have, you have to. You have, you have to. to. Um, you have but, to. But during this, during the rest of the year and, and most of the summer, we just we just let things grow. That's um, amazing. And and the picture on the on the left, um, I think went back to a topic a little bit further back. But Mario touched on it with his um, with his herb garden, and I think that's another thing that people are focusing more on. Like Mario said, is is an edible garden, a garden they can go out and pick fruit, um, pick vegetables, have herbs and just you know, cultivate on their own 
on their own site. And that's what this is. Basically, this is a citrus calamander grove designed to fit within the garden on the left there, I'm sorry. And um, my client actually goes out there, she picks these calamundans and cooks with them, bakes pies, whatever. Um, but she loves it, you know, it's fruit in her own garden. And I think there's something special about that. Definitely rewarding about that. And these, the, what's the sort of under planting here? I love that. So that, if I remember correctly, it's hard to see, but I think that is a, um, a Simpson jasmine. And then there's like a ground cover, oh. um, an additional ground cover of minima underneath that. So great. And okay, I realized there may be, is there may be, this I think is the last slide. Yeah, um, so I think you had mentioned something about mixing modern with old and new. Yes, yes. <laughs> How do you guys do that so successfully? Because you really do. Well, I think uh, the picture on the left is a little different approach, but um, this is a project that Mari and I worked on um, many, many years ago um, for a younger couple. And they collected antiques, like warehouses, like it was it was a nauseating. It was like so painful how many antiques they had <laughs> to incorporate into the garden. So, but at the same time, they were very hip and a little bit more modern. So we had to figure out ways to combine the materials to work in the space. Um, and I thought this was a pretty interesting shot where you have this um, kind of sleek modern banquette with a fire pit in the middle and then these great old French limestone urns flanking it that define the space but also contrast with some of the more modern stark elements, especially the, the day bed in the background. Yeah. Um, yeah. Love that. Just, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to work but Yeah, with. The, the sense of contrast, there's a lot of, um, you sort of feel like you need permission to do that, like, yeah. but, but right. this, this grants it. it, it makes it really cool. Yeah, it, you're right. Um, and I think when it comes to the, it depends on the client and the person, but there's no really right or wrong answer. I mean, it's like art, you see what you like and that's it. Yeah. Um, and then I'm not sure why I showed this image. I can't remember quite. <laughs> well, you showed it because it was native plants used in another uh, form. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I <laughs> love that. I Correct. love that. So, so um, a little plug to McKinnon Harris for their beautiful furniture line sitting in the middle of the garden. But beautiful. this is a formal, call it a knot garden, um, is surrounded by a massive jungle on the exterior. This is actually elevated above um, a concrete um, terrace uh, or garage, I should say. There's a garage below it. Wow. So there's about nine inches to work with. So we raise the planters up. You can see those little curbs to give us another nine inches and allow us to plant these gardens. But it's a very formal garden. Um, and it's just surrounded by these beautiful old palms and trees. And you, you have no idea it's there until you walk up the steps that are on the side and, and, and come up into this environment. So that is yes. really amazing. I love, the, I love the formality with the um, native. Yeah, exactly. That's why I had the image. Thank you, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> I love it too. That's why I think we talked about it. <laughs> really, really great. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I think we've gone over by just a few minutes. So thank you for um, sticking with us. And um, Keith and Mario, thank you so much for your time on a Monday morning, especially a cold, at least at least not in Florida, it's cold and dreary. So, <laughs> it's not um, cold. Hopefully you all can, you've cheered us up with your sunshine and your, and your sense of escape in the garden. And um, I just, I'm so appreciative. It's so nice to see you both. Thank, Thank you, you Neil. And Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and Happy Holidays. Yes, yes. that's right. Yes. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, Happy everything. Happy <laughs> everything. <laughs> Thank you again for, for allowing us to do this with you. Oh my yes. goodness. Take care, Thanks, all the best. And to a new year when we can get together, hopefully in person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you all. You.